All right, thank you everyone for coming to Cloud Native Data Pipelines. Uh, my name is Sid Anand. Um, to start off with, I'll tell you a bit about me. I've been in the Bay Area for about 15 years. Um, most of my time has been spent building end-to-end -end data infrastructure at companies that operate at scale. So those include LinkedIn, Netflix, eBay, and Etsy. For the last two years, I've been working at a, a security SaaS startup called Agari. Um, and they're doing some pretty interesting things with data in the cloud, and that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. Um, in my spare time, I'm a co-chair for QCon, SF, and London. Uh, I'm also a committer and PPMC member on Apache Airflow, a project that is, uh, was created by the person following me, Max, Maxime. Maxime, are you here? There he is. All right. Um, and I'm a father of two, a four-year-old boy and a, a six-month-old girl. So um, for those of you not familiar with Agari, what does Agari do? We make email safe again. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with email, it's actually never been safe. Uh, it's like SMTP has been around since the 70s, and it's only more recently that uh, security protocols like uh, SPF, DKIM, and DMARC have gained some adoption, but it's definitely not widespread. So we are still living in this world where you get an email from your credit card company uh, telling you that there's a suspicious charge and you're about to be locked out of your account. And before you know it, um, you, you know, type in your password and you get phished. Um, so seven years ago, when Agari launched, they were trying to solve this problem. And most of my uh, previous companies, those include you know, you know, eBay, LinkedIn, Netflix, they all had consumers, right? And um, they didn't want those consumers to be phished by emails pretending to be from them. So um, Agari's first uh, product was like solving this problem. When I joined two years ago, they wanted to solve uh, the problem that businesses are facing. Um, so if you remember LinkedIn a few years ago, like lost 17 million passwords, and that came through some sort of email route. Um, so the um, the product uh, that you know when I joined that we started building is a way to stop uh, what we call like zero day email attacks, which are just you know very targeted phish emails with no prior signatures. So how do we solve this problem? Um, our first version of this pro problem or, or product was um, a visibility product. So what that essentially meant is we had customers. Uh, that would deploy our uh, Docker-based like email sensor in their uh, enterprise, so on-premise. And as they got mail into their email infrastructure, they would send us the headers, just the headers. Um, and they would send it to us in a batch. Like every 15 minutes, a new file drop would happen on S3. And we're running in the cloud, so we would read that data. We'd build some trust models. We'd um, score the data as uh, on a scale of trustedness. Um, and we just you know, put it up on our website and show them a view of, of their mail flow, like how much email were they getting that was sort of like fishy. About a year ago, we developed a near real-time product um, that instead of getting batches of this, we're just getting streaming metadata all the time. And we continue to show uh, this, this visibility uh, into their mail flow in real time. But we also have a control system that will take action and eliminate those emails. And it's pretty interesting because you know, um, we are running something in the cloud, we're getting, and we're actually taking action on a Docker container in, uh, on premise. And end to end, uh, five nines, we're doing it in like three seconds. And most of that traffic is happening over the you know, public internet. Our uh, like near real time pipeline has to be just really fast and always fast. So that's a really key part of this uh, system. So pretty much everyone uh, here has uh, experience with data pipelines. And data pipelines tend to fall, uh, fall in like two categories, um, BI and predictive. So let's say you work at Spotify or Netflix, and your customers are interacting with your website. Um, and as your customers interact with your website, um, data is being stored in some sort of OLTP database. Um, and that database could be uh, MySQL, Oracle, or Cassandra. And every day, um, data will get uh, pulled out of that database as part of some ETL, loaded into a data warehouse. 
And that data warehouse, uh, combined with maybe Kafka tracking data, um, will, uh, will you know, give your business insight into what's happening. So it'll you know, usually be fed into some sort of reporting. Or your business analysts will use uh, some sort of query browser to, to query and analyze that data. That's like a typical uh, like warehouse use case, business intelligence. Uh, another interesting type of pipe pipeline is a predictive data pipeline. And this is pretty common as well. Um, essentially, you have some sort of data source. Um, the data source could be data at rest, or it could be streaming data. And you have, you'll have some sort of processing framework, uh, Flink, Beam, Storm, Spark, what have you. Um, and this framework will take that data and do something interesting with it, like it will rank it, it will personalize it to get, uh, get a subset of the data that's personalized to each end user. Um, it, may also uh, it may also categorize the data. Um, and the result of those um, computations will be stored in some sort of cache, uh, either Redis, um, or it'll be stored in a, you know, a really fast data store like Cassandra, um, or, or maybe just a database like Oracle. And then web servers will serve this as a data product. Right? And you've seen these data products like every day. So if you visited uh, like Netflix or Spotify, the data products that, you, that are the output of this data pipeline would be content recommendations. Like here's a movie you might like, here's a song you should listen to. Um, if you're using Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, you'll get network re recommendations. Like here's someone, um, here's someone you should follow. If you're buying something online in Amazon or eBay, um, you'll get item recommendations, like people who bought this also buy this, right? Um, and then every search engine also is a great, great example of recommender systems because the ranking in there is done through some sort of recommendation. Um, now, what we're actually working on at Agari is recommender systems, per se. It's actually um, fraud prevention. And that's another you know, typical use case of data pipelines, right? Um, whether uh, it's iTunes looking for uh, weird purchases, um, they, they have a fraud prevention pipeline. Um, we also have a fraud prevention pipeline uh, looking for a zero-day email attack and, and taking it out before, it, before you click on it. Now, what do I mean by cloud-native data pipelines, right? Um, so, if you work at you know, a large company, you know, LinkedIn, and actually many companies that run, say, in a data center, um, they have very large data infrastructure teams, teams of 200, right? Like the, like the Cassandra team at, at, at Apple is bigger than all of Agari's engineering, right? So um, why do they have these teams? Well, if you look at data engineering teams, they're essentially a team of specialists, right? Uh, typical deployments would have like Cassandra, perhaps, or HBase, uh, Spark, or Flink, uh, Kafka, Elasticsearch, and all of these are pretty complicated beasts. And you need uh, you know, not just one expert, sometimes you need two, to really understand and tune what ha what's going on when things go bad, when, when data grows to a scale that it doesn't work. Um, Agari can't really uh, you know, do that, right? We have uh, so many technologies and so few engineers, and we'd burn everyone out with you know, operational fatigue. So we, you know, what can we do given that you know, we operate in the cloud like most startups? And the idea is that there are some cloud-native techniques. And you know, of course, when those uh, don't work for us, we, we'll adopt some, some sort of open source technology that we will become experts on. Uh, and we'll try to get the same sort of uh, guarantees that like, big data companies can get from their data pipelines. Um, and you know, when possible, we'll go for a hosted solution. And when not possible, you know, we'll become experts in that open source technology. So when building um, a data pipeline, what are some desirable qualities to make it fault tolerant um, and you know, uh, operable? For us, it's correctness, timeliness, cost, and operability. So what, what does that mean? So for correctness, uh, it means that there is data integrity end to end. We don't lose data. We don't corrupt data. Um, also, if we're running a predictive data pipeline, it means that we're getting uh, personalized or scored data. And so we'd expect over time that 
the, the distribution of those scores is at least what we expect, um, and it shouldn't change too much. It should be somewhat stable. From a timeliness perspective, uh, whether you're running a daily batch or um, an hourly batch or like near real time, the pipeline needs to stick to its SLAs. From operability um, perspective, from an operability perspective, it's like really, really key to to avoid like operational fatigue. Right? You have these uh, very specialized data engineers. They're really smart, and they shouldn't spend all of their time keeping your service up. And um, if you work at these like larger companies, you'll find that uh, there's a lot of operational fatigue. Many of these engineers are just spending 90% of the time keeping things running. Uh, and in addition, uh, we need some sort of monitoring and alerting, you know, because we, we need to check if we're sticking to our correctness and timeliness SLAs. And finally, you know, quick recoverability. Um, there's this interesting comparison between uh, like a Jeep and um, uh, like a Bentley, I guess, or a Rolls Royce. And essentially, uh, Rolls Royces are highly, like really well designed to work on, you know, roads, right? Um, but if you take them out of their you know, operational design uh, constraints, like let's say it's like a really wet road or they have to go through mud or up a hill, they break down. And when they break down, you've got to fix it. And fixing it is a lengthy process. Um, so they're really designed for what's called like MTBF, or mean time between failures. They, they're designed to, uh, and I actually took the slide out for time, but um, I probably should have kept it in. But es essentially, they're designed for, um, to, to not fail. But if they're ever pushed outside of their design criteria, the, there's a lengthy process to fix a Rolls Royce. Whereas a Jeep uh, the, you know, is designed to be beat up, uh, and they're designed for what's called MTTR, mean time to recovery. So they're designed to be pushed beyond their limits, break down, and be quickly fixable. So for us, that we want something designed for MTTR. We want to automate everything, but whenever something happens that we didn't expect, to fix it quickly. And if you work on a data pipeline, let me just get a, a set of hands. How many of you actually maintain or work on data pipelines? All right, so how many of you uh, understand or have encountered that when there's a bug, you don't have to just fix the bug, but fix all the downstream data you've corrupted or lost? Right, and that's sort of the operational fatigue that people run into, so we need a system that is quickly recoverable for that use case. And finally, cost, pay as you go. So as I mentioned, we have um, a few different use cases. Uh, the ones I'm actually going to be talking about today is called message scoring. I'm not going to talk too much about model building. Um, just once models are built, um, how we use it for message scoring in both our batch and uh, near real time architectures. So let's jump into our ba batch uh, pipeline architecture. So um, we have these customers. They've all uh, installed a sensor. And these sensors are getting mail flow and uploading a file every 15 minutes to S3. Um, we have uh, an airflow job that will kick off Spark at the top of every hour. And that job will read this input data, score it, and generate some sort of aggregates. When it's done, it'll write it back to S3. And we have S3 set up with what's called SNS SQS notification. Essentially, every object we put will um, send um, this, uh, the, the, new, the new file notification um, to SNS, and it'll get queued up in simple queue service, which is Amazon's uh, SQS. When that happens, we automatically spin up um, through an auto-scaling group, um, a group of what we call importers, and their job is to take this data, uh, clean it in some way, and uh, load it into our Postgres database. So S3 sort of holds all of our data, but uh, a small portion of our data is loaded into a database because that's really what our Rails web app is going to show to our users for our visibility product. So this is our architecture, and um, we use Airflow to manage everything that's in orange. Um, so that's our workflow engine for this like batch use case. So I'm not going to walk through every item on this list, but so, sort of these are the architectural components. And when we were picking these components, 
um, we leverage things that were like serverless or what we call managed so that we don't have that headache. But when we, found, we didn't find an adequate solution in Amazon, that's when we decided to operate it ourselves. So for example, um, if you're running in your own data center, uh, how many of you actually run in your own data center versus the cloud? Raise your hand if you run in your own data center. Does everyone else use the cloud? OK, so most of you already use the cloud. So S3 is sort of our HDFS, right? It's um, where we put all input data, all intermediate data, all final output data. Um, it's scalable, available, performant. We never have to really worry about it. Whereas if we ran our own HDFS cluster, we would. Um, we would have to worry about it and, and basically growing it and scaling it and keeping it up. Um, and you know, uh, so, so that's one of them. And then for SNS plus SQS, that combination, um, before Kinesis was really, uh, I would say, production ready, um, we, we actually picked this. It's uh, like a reliable transactional pub sub model. It's, it's really good, and it's worked really well for us, and it's super cheap. Um, and then for processing, we have two types. We have sort of like the typical data science processing, which would, in our case, be scoring, model building, uh, aggregation. Um, and you know, Spark is awesome in the sense that it has this like, really nice programming model, but it's really complicated, very hard to debug, uh, especially for things like performance. And it's like, very easy to get yourself into a problem where you've got a very complex um, DAG graph, and you can't figure out why your job is taking so long. Um, but for a more simple type of processing, we use you know, an auto-scale group of, of instances. And as I mentioned, we use Airflow for managing all of our Spark jobs and complex flows. Um, it's lightweight. Uh, it uses, um, instead of, it uses con uh, like config as code, that model. So all the workflows are actually defined in code. So you can sort of put that code through your normal uh, code um, development pipeline. Uh, and it, it does have a, a steep learning curve when it comes to operability. Um, Airflow isn't very opinionated about how it's operated. That's something outside of like, what, what we've actually defined for it. And it is something that people run into. Uh, and finally, we use Postgres for no better reason but uh, the Rails developers picked Postgres uh, before the data pipeline engineer joined the company. So we use Postgres. Um, we operate those three. But we are, you know, as, as I talk about our near real-time pipeline, I'm going to show you some of the cool things that we've done um, to move away from it. So how do we tackle cost and timeliness? So when we were running daily, our architecture was designed to be low cost. What does that mean? So for the things I mentioned that are things we operate, what that essentially means is we're running it on an EC2 instance all of the time. So here, that's a database, a web app, and, and our Airflow server. But everything else doesn't cost us anything for 23 hours of the day. At the end of the day, we did a nightly run. And at that point, we spun up EMR. Um, as messages got pushed into the pipeline, our importers got spun up from zero. Uh, and we paid for one hour of work. Uh, and that was it. And that was a good cost saving. Well, we took this to an, we just changed uh, Airflow to run from daily to hourly. And we saved nothing in terms of cost. Because if you know something about EC2, they charge you at the hour boundary. And even if we took 10 minutes to do all our work, uh, we were paying for the full hour. So um, this really wasn't a cost saving. Um, if you're familiar with lambdas, um, anything that you can move to lambda, you should, because they charge you up to 100 milliseconds. So if you take 200 milliseconds, you just pay for those 200 milliseconds. Um, if you take 201 milliseconds, you're paying for 300 milliseconds. It's vastly cheaper than the typical EC2 model for compute. How about timeliness? Um, how many of you have used autoscaling? Uh, just a show of hands. OK, so maybe seven or eight people. Um, so autoscaling, uh, there, there's two ways we handle timeliness. Um, first of all, for the Spark side, um, if we want a Spark job to get faster, uh, one option is to throw more resources at it, and because we have Airflow spin it up, it's just a matter of a config of how many like, workers we want to spin up, and Airflow will, uh, before the run starts, spin up an EMR cluster um, to that size, and we'll get the kind of performance we expect. Um, for our more general processing, 
uh, we use an auto scaling group, uh, like these importers. And essentially the idea is, as mes messages show up on SQS, we should scale these importers out to, um, to more quickly import them into our database. Why is this important? So in our hourly pipeline, sometimes our Spark jobs would take 50 minutes, which meant that we only had a time budget of under 10 minutes to import all of them into the database. Um, this is where the importers really shine. Um, regardless of what was happening with our Spark job, uh, we could just increase, you know, change the max value for these uh, auto scale groups to, to increase the speed or throughput into our database for importing. So our first model um, for auto scaling was to use what's called a CPU based trigger. So what this really means is with an auto scaler, you provide some sort of scale out policy and a scale in policy. So, so for us, we said um, the thing that we're scaling out look at the average CPU of that thing, uh, of the cluster. And if it goes above 40% average CPU, grow it out, like add another machine to the cluster. Just try to maintain 40% CPU on average, okay? So the graph at the bottom shows that um, for the cluster, as it's going through scaling in and out, um, the autoscaler is really good at sticking at 40%, and that's what, what this is. It's basically right around 40%. Now, let's look at these graphs. So um, this right here is the message, message rate going into our SQS queue. Um, that's coming from Spark. And now uh, we start off with zero uh, importers. Uh, and now as messages are going, uh, this is the messages being consumed by our importers. And this is the total CPU of the ASG cluster. It's going up linearly. So what's happening is the autoscaler starts at zero, and then it starts adding machines in these little steps. And as it does so, it's improving, the, it's increasing the rate of consuming these messages. Um, and then it spins up the cluster to a max size, and when there are no messages left, it spins the cluster down. And all the while, its only goal is to try to stick at 40% CPU on average, and is excellent at doing that. There is a problem, and the problem is that Right here, we get what's called premature scaling. So when there are, like, say, more machines than messages on SQS, the CPU drops dramatically. There's, like, let's say, one message left on SQS, just one message, or, or like a batch. Uh, so one message left, and then what's going to happen is the auto scaler is going to start scaling in, kind of at random, and it may pick the one machine that's processing that one message. And that one message will actually never get processed because you have no control about which machine is going to get scaled in. So this was the problem with using CPU. It, um, there were different approaches like, you know, just sort of wait a really long time for the signal. But there was not like really a great method to solve this problem when we were just using average CPU because this was really more of an IO bound kind of process and CPU wasn't really a great measure. So the, the approach we took was to use queue-based uh, scaling. So um, how many of you have used SQS? Um, OK, a few of you, maybe five. So SQS has two metrics. One metric is um, the count of visible messages. Those are the ones you can get. And then once you get a message, it becomes invisible. It becomes an in-flight message. So for the in-flight messages, um, you get a separate thing called the invisible message count. So what we do is, we use the scale-out policy is based only on visible messages. That's the blue line. So over time, messages are being added by, the, by Spark, so the count of messages goes up to the peak. And of course, as we start consuming the messages here, this starts dropping till uh, zero. Actually, this is really, um, sorry, this is approximate number of messages visible. So now all of these messages, um, this is just basically the number of visible messages, and at this point, all of the messages are in flight. There are no more messages that are visible. They're all in flight. But they're being processed, and that's taking some amount of time. So we keep scaling out as long as this blue line is above zero. That helps us scale out to a maximum size. And then uh, we watch this orange curve, and this orange curve is invisible message count. And that's like in flight messages. When we get, so when we get to this point, all the messages are currently in process. We're, we're actually processing them. And then as they get finished, 
are completed, this orange curve drops to zero, and that means every single, the last message has been processed successfully, and when that happens, we scale in from you know, 25 nodes to zero in a snap. So this completely worked for us, um, and uh, there wasn't really a blog about this anywhere. Um, it wasn't even like, kind of mentioned in Amazon about queue scaling, but this turned out to be a, a great help, help to us. So um, when talking about auto-scaling, some people ask, how do we do it? Um, so we are big proponents of Terraform, Ansible, and Packer. Um, so uh, just to get a sense of, of, of people, what they use, how many of you use Terraform? Okay, some of you are really advanced. Uh, how many of you use Ansible? Okay, and what about Packer? It's probably the same person. All right, okay, so um, Terraform is what you use to declaratively spin up um, like uh, like uh, Amazon uh, inst uh, Amazon resources like e SQS, Kinesis, EC2, ASGs, all of that stuff. Um, Ansible is what you use. It's sort of a replacement for Chef and Puppet. It's a way to install the packages you need on a given instance. So, for example, uh, like SciPy or Pandas or Scikit-Learn, like all of those things are things you may install on a machine so that you could use it for some interesting like data science, right? You'd use Ansible to declaratively specify on a like, fresh machine what packages to install. And Packer is this other thing that is used to what's called a, like create what's called an AMI, an Amazon machine image. So let's get a sense of how we use it. Um, step one, Packer spins up a temporary EC2 node. And that's a blank canvas. It's just spinning up an EC2 node. Step two, it runs our Ansible playbook to install all of the stuff, uh, like all the Ruby packages or Python packages or Java packages we need to run the business logic and, and, and get the server up and running. Uh, step three, we snapshot um, the EC2 instance to get an AMI, and we no longer need this temporary instance, we tear it down. Packard just destroys it. The result is we got an image. Why do we care about an image? Well. Um, Terraform will take this image and it will deploy an auto-scaling group of this image. So we're not really managing servers at this point. We're just um, building these AMIs and telling Amazon's auto-scaling group, you manage these servers using these AMIs. The other technique we're following in some places is to use uh, lambdas. Uh, now the thing is, and I'll talk about this a bit later, but like our, our company of 20 people codes in four languages. So we have services in Node, Ruby, Python, and Java. And Lambda doesn't support Ruby. Um, so we're still using this approach for our Ruby jobs, um, like our serverless approach to like Ruby. Um, and for the others, we're moving those to Lambda. So we've sort of talked about the timeliness and cost. Um, what about the other two? So with data pipelines, um, automation is key, right? So we don't want to, um, we want something where we can manage and configure and author workflows very simply. Uh, we need visibility into how our workflows are running, and we need like good integration with our alerting and monitoring tools. And about two years ago, um, I went to a talk that uh, Max was giving, and, and I, we, came up, we were looking for this solution, and Amazon didn't have a good one. And Apache Airflow is what we actually settled on. It's, it, it basically helps you define um, workflows as like Python code. Uh, if you've used other things like Uzi, they're, they're defined in XML. Uh, or Azkaban, it's just like a bunch of zip files and maybe YAML files, it's, it's quite terrible. Um, and just like being able to write stuff in uh, code uh, is really great. Things like Luigi also support this. And then you can visually see your um, workflow. So this is sort of the workflow that's managing this data pipeline. And it's very easy to manage multiple pipelines. And you can pause some of them. Uh, some of these are on, some are paused. They have uh, different types of schedules. Like we support like cron syntax as well as um, like you can use like Python time delta. You can also um, specify some uh, built-in ones, like hourly, daily, uh, I guess monthly must be one. 
Um, and we get like at a glance statistics or statuses on how many of our runs are successful or in progress or failing. It's very easy to manage workflows. Before this, we were using cron. It was, a, it was quite a nightmare. Um, and if you want to see, for a given run, what's taking the longest time, that's also easy with the Gantt chart. Um, this essentially shows you that our, our total run was 18 minutes for an hourly run. It took 18 minutes to do one, an hourly run. And of course, we paid for the full hour. And of that time, the Spark job took 10 minutes. And the importing took, I don't know, what does it say, like a minute or two minutes? So the import took about two minutes to complete, and the Spark job took about 10 minutes. Now, how, now the next question might be, does it always run like this? And the, and the answer to that is, no, it doesn't. Because we're constantly modifying the Spark job, and we're also uh, seeing an increase in like data growth. So it's good to see a time-oriented view of um, the performance. And here's a great example. Our, this, this is the, our Spark job, and it's always taking the most time. This, the Spark task is always taking the most time in our job. And at one point over four weeks, it was taking longer every time it ran. So we had a bug. And it's creeping up into this 0.55, or essentially, this is half an hour, right? Uh, it was taking you know, 20 minutes, and it's now beating over half an hour. And it turned, out, it turned out to be a bug. We fixed it, and we brought the time back. And we did more optimization and brought it back. And we did more optimization and brought it down. And then, of course, we broke something or added some new feature calculation, and it went up again. But this really helps us keep track of whether we're on our SLAs. Finally, we use Slack and uh, VictorOps. And it's very easy to integrate um, Airflow with these. So anytime we're missing our time SLA or we're getting discrepancies, we get paged and we get a, a, a link uh, pasted into our Slack window. Um, and when we click on it, we can see, for example, for this customer, this org ID 54, um, we were getting 60% data loss. All of a sudden, we, f we were paged, fixed it, and it, it went away. It's just very easy to help us run operations. So we sort of talked about um, the batch side of things. What about the near real-time side of things? So similar to before, our enterprises are running collectors. Those collectors are sending us data. Now they're sending it over Kinesis, which is essentially Amazon's uh, answer to Kafka. And we have scorers running that are scoring this data in an auto-scaling group. And they write their score output message by message to Kinesis. And then we have importers reading from Kinesis and writing it to our database. And we also have a separate service uh, called an alerter. And that alerter is getting these messages and sort of quarantining the email. And this whole pipeline runs in under a couple of seconds. So I'm not going to go over every single thing on here, but I think the most important takeaway is, right? Kinesis versus Kafka. So uh, we don't have enough people to like, manage Kafka, and Kafka can be something that's difficult to manage. So Kinesis actually works quite well for us. Um, Lambda versus ASG. So I, as I mentioned, we're going towards Lambda. It's cheaper for us. It's, you, know, you, you only pay up to the 100 millisecond mark. Um, and um, uh, it, you know, we run Python, Java, Node. Those all run in Lambdas. Um, but like our Ruby jobs are still running in this ASG model. An important, uh, an important thing to understand here is when we went from um, hourly to near real time, we thought we could just take our Spark job and just like uh, basically implement the, the real time micro batching, and that didn't work. Uh, essentially, the jobs were so complicated. Um, I'm, okay, the jobs are so complicated that um, the, uh, we couldn't get stuff done within a five minute window because the jobs are written for bash that take an hour and they were okay with taking half an hour. And those complex computations couldn't just, they had to be completely rewritten to, to support uh, like micro batching in under a few seconds. So essentially, we were, the best we could do was like five minutes. And for a near real-time pipeline, that's not at all near real-time. So we essentially took out the scoring from Spark, and we just use Spark for model builds. That's all it does now. Um, and another really interesting thing here is um, we used to do pre-aggregation in our database. Um, that doesn't really work 
uh, for near real-time pipelines because data comes late. And because it's late arrival data, your aggregates are always off. So we essentially took, we killed pre-aggregation. We replaced our aggregation in uh, Postgres with Elasticsearch, and we do real-time on-the-fly aggregation. And it turned out to just work perfectly. Now our UI never has discrepancies, we'd never have late arrival data, and it's actually faster. And another thing was um, our data science workloads, we're doing window, like, window functions, and we, it needed to hit a database to do that, and Postgres was too slow for a near real-time batch, uh, sorry, a near real-time processing pipeline, so we just replaced it with Redis. So we essentially took out a lot of the stuff we used to throw at Postgres, and, and I guess one other thing is search, and we moved it to like a polyglot persistence model. Our, new, our, our like data science is hitting Redis for the real-time batch. Um, our web app is doing searches and aggregates now against a real-time um, engine, which is Elasticsearch, and we're only using Postgres as a place to put detailed information, and that's it. Um, and this model has really worked for us. So I'm going to kind of speed up a little uh, because we are, might be running out of time, but um, this is a, the last major part of my talk. Um, Avro. So how many of you use Avro? Not even half. Okay. So Avro is, so w when you think about data at rest, typically you think about data in a database, right? And um, that data has a schema, and when you start interacting, with that data, that schema ensures that data doesn't get corrupt. But what about two jobs that communicate through a file on a system? Where is there any sort of um, integrity check? Well, that's where Avro comes in. Avro is a schema on top of a file at rest, right? So, um, and it supports primitive data types, it supports complex nested data types, and it has very good language bindings. So, we decided that all data at rest, and actually even data that's sent over a stream, should be Avro. If it's not in a database, it has to be written in Avro. And one other benefit is schema evolution, I'm gonna talk about it. So why is Avro useful, and why is it useful to us, right? So as I mentioned, we have these sensors. We have hundreds of customers, they're all running sensors, and we can't really decide when they upgrade their sensors. So at any given time, they're running a different version of the sensor, and different versions of the sensors are sending different versions of data to us. So in this case, V1, V2, V3. What's the difference? They have different fields. Um, and what's even more complicated, at any given time, they're writing to the same Kinesis stream, and we're getting a mix of versions coming to us. And the version that our servers are running on are in a completely different version, version four. Avro actually helps us solve this problem without ever knowing about this or worrying about it. Essentially, we do schema evolution on the fly. We never care what version anyone is running. Our code just does the following. It says writer schema is the version four. Oh, sorry, uh, reader schema is version four. It's what the consumers compiled against. The writer schema is uh, whatever was sent over the wire to us. And the datum reader will do a union and figure out the right schema to use to analyze that data. We never have an outage, we never have to worry about this. It was like the right decision to go with from the beginning. And it's so useful that we don't just use it for data coming from our sensors, our IoT sensors. We use it for all data used for communication between every process or, or service running in our pipeline. So um, it's, we decouple all our services through Kinesis plus Avro. And as I mentioned, we run four languages, and the language bindings are actually quite good. We have Java, uh, Python, Ruby, and Node. And right now, Node doesn't use Avro, but, um, but all the others communicate through Avro, no problem. And to give you kind of an example um, of what an Avro schema looks like, uh, here's one. You essentially have a record called user. It has three fields, name, favorite number, favorite color. Um, it's a record type, schema is the user. Typically, uh, Avro is, uses a, writes a header to the top of a file, and in this file you have these little datum blocks, which are the records, and you could have a billion or a million of these. And the schema has very little overhead, like 0.001% on average. But what happens if you send this over the wire? Now all of a sudden you're sending one data in near real time, 
but the overhead of the schema is 99%. That is way too much. So a trick that we did at LinkedIn and that Kafka uses and Confluent uses is that you don't send the schema over the wire. What you do is you store it in a registry somewhere, you get an ID out, and you just send the ID, uh, like a single number, item across the wire. So we built, uh, we're gonna open source this schema registry that's based on a Lambda. And um, essentially, um, the producer will get an ID, but when it registers a schema, it'll send the ID with the data. Um, the consumer will read that, it'll deserialize it. Uh, I mean, it will basically get the schema by ID, cache it, and then decode the Avro. And all of our pipelines uh, save about 99% throughput. Um, and, and that's how we get like, quite high uh, speed in our pipelines. Uh, and our schema registry, if you remember this picture, is like deployed wherever we have Kinesis. So I think at this point, um, I'm actually done with the talk. Uh, it was probably kind of fast, lots of details. If you have further questions, please come and chat with me later. Um, and I'd like to thank my whole team, uh, which is uh, everybody on this slide. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much.